Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Ray Coyle. I'm facilitating the session today. Uh, we've still got some people um, joining. So if you can just give me a couple more minutes to make sure that we let people in, because, um, yeah, we've still got quite a lot of people joining, which is wonderful. Okay, we seem to have a, a, a pause in the people joining, um, so I'll just get started on um, just a couple of formalities for today, um, particularly for those of you who have not joined um, other small charity week webinars like this one. Um, I've got everybody's microphone on mute, um, and we have uh, four panelists today, and I've asked them via the Zoom thingy to unmute their microphones. Uh, and I hope that works, because if we can't hear them, this is really not going to be a great session. Um, but if we keep everybody else on mute, it means we can reduce the background noise. It means we can really clearly hear the speakers. Um, and what I'd like you guys to do is to use the chat feature to ask any questions, make any comments, or um, pass any compliments along to our panelists today. Um, and as they're going to be doing most of the talking, I will keep an eye on the chat and I will try and pick up the themes that are coming through on the chat and feed them in through to our panelists. Um, so first of all, I should introduce myself, which I obviously should have started with, but I'm slightly distracted by pressing the admit button every couple of seconds. Um, my name is Ray Coyle. Um, I am the chair of the, the co-chair of the Small Charities Panel at the NCDO, um, and I also sit on the England Committee for the National Lottery Community Fund. Um, I also have a day job running a small charity, uh, Oxford Hub, which is a community charity in Southeast Oxford. Um, so I'm here just to facilitate today's session. Um, we have four fantastic um, panelists today. We have uh, Mary Rose Gunn from The Four, uh, we have uh, Alex from Lloyd's Bank Foundation, Martha from Civic Power Fund, and Carol from Money for You. And what I'd like to do now is just to hand over to our panelists um, in that order so that they know what's coming, um, and just ask them to quickly introduce themselves before we um, try and think of a first difficult question for them. Um, so Mary Rose, if hopefully your microphone is working, if you could just introduce yourself and tell our participants a little bit about yourself. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, Ray. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Mary Rose Gunn, and I'm the founder and the chief executive of The Four. We are a funder, um, but we are a venture philanthropy funder, so we provide unrestricted funding, skills and training support, and help with impact measurement to small charities across the UK. Anyone who's registered as a charity or a social enterprise in the UK is eligible. Uh, and the reason that we do what we do is because there are so many barriers to access for small charities to get hold of the sort of support that they need. Um, particularly, we, you know, we really concentrate on funding that is transformational to organizations that have basically got demand that outstrips su supply. So we are helping uh, charities and social enterprises that are looking to scale their impact in some way that might be by scaling what they do, or it might be by replicating, um, or it might be by just making them more sustainable and um, uh, able to exist in the longer term by becoming more resilient. Um, and we Hopefully, sorry, am I talking, is this what you were hoping for, Ray, in terms of an introduction? Beyond my wildest dreams. <laughs> but we uh, we uh, really intend more than anything to be a funder that is on the side of small charities. So everything that we do, we try and do it 
um, in a way that is treating charities as the experts that they are. It's about raising confidence, increasing morale. We try and make sure that our application process is giving, um, is adding value so that what we ask people to do um, during that process is uh, something that even if they're not successful in getting the funding from us is potentially something that it would have been useful or either it would have been useful for them to do anyway or else it didn't take up loads of their time because um, we are incredibly aware I mean we're a small charity ourselves but that time spent fundraising is time away from your beneficiaries um, and away from your mission so uh, that's what we do thank Fantastic. you thank you um, Alex could I ask you just to say a little bit about yourself and about LBF hi everyone um, Thanks uh, for being here. And thank you to NCBO for inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm the Research and Learning Manager at Lloyds Bank Foundation for England and Wales. As the name suggests, we're a, a grant maker, a funder that's um, supported by the Lloyds profit of Lloyds Banking Group. Uh, we've been around for um, almost 40 years. And in that whole time, we've basically specialized in focusing on uh, giving grants to small charities. Um, and we're particularly focused on small, local and specialist charities delivering services in their community um, in, uh, in England and Wales. Um, I think the sort of um, uh, philosophy of our, of our funding approach has always been to try and meet the kind of needs that um, the needs of charities that will enable them to best achieve their mission um, and not centre our own kind of agenda um, uh, in in overruling perhaps the, the what small charities are setting out to do. So we do that in kind of three main ways. Um, the first is um, the way that we offer funding. Um, we offer unrestricted and long-term funding, so over three years, and we think that's incredibly important to support the stability, uh, but also enable flexibility um, and adaption to change among the charities we support. We offer a lot of capacity building support, um, like the four alongside the grant. Uh, that can be anything from support to develop business planning, from HR advice, um, from fundraising strategy to also support to, um, uh, for the welfare and resilience of frontline staff. Um, and we also benefit from having a lot of colleagues from our kind of corporate parent at Lloyds Banking Group who offer kind of their time um, for skills, sort of kind of skilled volunteering. And the final thing that we do, and I think in my role as the kind of research lead is probably one of them, what I think has been the most important is to try and kind of actively champion the role and distinctiveness of small charities um, around England and Wales. I think that's a really important way that we can kind of create change. So we've invested a lot in, in research, uh, particularly over the past couple of years to try and evidence the distinctive value of, of small and local charities. Um, and all of our reports are on our website. And we also developed a kind of platform for sharing data about small charities um, called smallcharitiesdata.org. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. Um, Martha, would you like to tell us a little bit about, um, about yourself and about Civic Power Fund? Certainly, thank you. It's really great to be here this afternoon. Um, so my name is Martha. I'm the Executive Director of the Civic Power Fund. The Civic Power Fund is a new independent intermediary funder that's focused specifically on grassroots community organising. And we're really motivated by two overarching factors. So we have quite a deep concern about the state of UK democracy and just how disenfranchised many communities are feeling from their politics. But we're also thinking about big picture social justice and share a frustration that across the social justice funding landscape, very little money actually gets into the hands of grassroots communities who are on the front lines fighting for their rights. And we see that as a justice issue now in that these groups should have the resources that they need to back their mission but also a strategy issue. If we think about long-term social justice, we're not gonna win the change that we want and need and hold on to that change without a real base of people power that can hold governments and decision makers to account for the long-term. And so we're trying to change that by shifting social justice resources into grassroots communities. And we have three ways that we're trying to do that. One is through a place-based funding strand, but we work very closely in key places and spaces to try and build up civic power over the long-term by resourcing and supporting small grassroots groups that are doing democratic engagement, campaigning and building power. Our other funding strand is around infrastructure. So boosting community organizing as a field right across the UK and resourcing new innovative lived experience led organizing groups to provide that support. 
And then we have a voice strand. Um, so we do a lot of convening of funders to feed back to them about the experiences of grassroots groups, but we also bring grassroots groups together to tell us a little bit more about what they need and what they need from funding. And through all of that, we try and offer, similar to my colleagues on the call, support, capacity building, and anything that groups really need to go from strength to strength. And because of that process and that focus, we end up working a lot with very, very small organisations, sometimes unconstituted or unincorporated groups as well. So some of the perspectives I hope to share today are from our experiences and interactions with those groups and some of the feedback that we've had. Thank you, Martha. Um, Carol, um, could you tell us a little bit about, about yourself and about Money For You? Yes, of course. Hi, everyone. Um, like my colleagues on the call, really pleased to be here. Uh, my name is Carol Akiwumi, and um, I'm the CEO and founder of Money For You. And Money For You is a nonprofit based here in the UK, but working internationally. And we're dedicated to eradicating economic inequalities faced by three main audiences, young people, nonprofits, and entrepreneurs. Now, today I'm gonna to be talking mostly about the work that we do with um, nonprofits. And our mission to them is driven by two fundamental experiences, the lack of reach by funders and investors to black, Asian, multi-ethnic and refugee led organizations, and the limited equitable access that these BEMA led organizations have to funding and finance. I suppose um, what most people know about us is the Avocado Plus Accelerator program, which we've been running. It's now in its seventh year for BEMA led nonprofits. It's a rigorous and innovative initiative, and it's designed specifically for very small charities and social enterprises that are led by BEMA founders. Its goal is to improve their sustainability, their fundraising capabilities, and their leadership skills. And so that program acknowledges the unique challenges faced by these organizations, um, recognizing that despite the significant needs that they address, they often struggle to gain momentum and build capacity over many years. We also run um, the Dragon's Den Initiative, which is an annual event, you know, that's prototyping the concept of participatory grant making. It's something that I hope I'm going to be talking about um, a little bit later on, because that's, you know, already run over 10, 10 years. And um, this year, we're going to be adding more, you know, bits to it just to demonstrate what that looks like and what our heart really reflects when it comes to increasing the flow of appropriate and fit for purpose finance for uh, BEMA led and um, underrepresented impact organizations, because we're really passionate about making sure that at the end of the day, we're working with funders like the ones we have on this call and others too, um, who are committed to building a future where all of these socially driven organizations in spite of their size and in spite of the communities that they serve can overcome the challenges that they face in accessing the right financial resources for them. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Um, so the, the first question I have on, on my piece of paper here um, is to, to the panelists is as, as a funder, how do you support smaller organizations? But you've all given such really quite wonderful introductions and stressed how you support smaller organizations. Um, I don't want to cover the same ground and particularly want to make this of value for our audience. So I'd like to just slightly change the question around and just ask you to talk about what would be the experience of a small charity engaging with your organization and how would it feel to one of the small charities we've got in our panel to engage with your organization? Um, and if we can go back the other way around and start with you, Carol, if that's OK, um, just so that we're not cycling through in a very predictable manner. <laughs> Thank you. That's helpful. In engaging with us, I mean, I talked about um, the accelerator uh, program, which BEMA led nonprofits um, attend over the period of one year. Uh, and that's really great. I talked about what it does. And I think just to add to that, the thing that we do is we provide targeted capacity building, educational resources and knowledge specifically designed to address the issues of resilience and sustainability. We nurture their growth, we help to enhance their impact. And again, we strive to equip them to not just survive, but to thrive. 
and to continue to create lasting change in their communities. And I, I suppose that's the key thing that they um, gained from taking part in that program. In the summer, I mean, this is the second year now, we've been running the executive program for leaders of those organizations, shorter course that enables them to get the foundations that they need to um, run their organizations properly. But there are three things I think that's really key when it comes to the funding work that we do with them. We're making sure that we're demystifying the funding process because for us, that's key. We want to eliminate confusion and uncertainty. And I really appreciate my colleagues talking about the fact that, you know, the, the application processes are easy. But honestly, that's not always the case from this perspective. And so for us, because all of our funds, everything we do is co-created by those that we serve, we can be sure that we're truly um making those processes, yeah, completely, not just easy, but also transparent. Um, the second thing is building their trust and relationships, because we understand that that transparency does that. So we're very keen about openly sharing data on funding allocation. And I know that that's something that more and more funders are doing now, um, because we know that that's not just going to create a and promote a more equitable environment, but it's going to improve the trust. And the third thing, of course, is making sure that all of that continues to equip those that we serve, particularly smaller BEMA-led nonprofits, because for most of them, the key barriers are lack of access, knowledge, and an understanding of how to navigate these funding processes more effectively with, as my colleague just recognized, the limited capacity that they have. So, uh, so Marta, if I could put the, the same question to you, to, to what, what's the what's the experience of small charity um, working with and engaging with Civic Power Fund, and maybe focusing a little on that? How easy is it to engage and to apply, and what are the barriers, and what what do people need to do? Well, I think the first thing I wanted to say is that we're quite new, um, so we've only been going for about a year and a half, and we did our first open grant round um, at the end of December last year. So really kind of early doors. So we're definitely still learning and we've learned a lot from others, including colleagues on this call about how to put these processes in place. I think there's four things that I want to touch upon that I hope that prospective grantees or partners experience when engaging with the Civic Power Fund. I think the first is, is really kind of agreeing with what Carol said around demystifying the funding process that first, it sounds really simple, but we just want people to know about the funding. And I think we've had so much feedback from many of the organizing groups that we work with that grant making is such a closed shop. And if people don't have connections or don't have access to funders or don't know about resources, simply they just don't get access to that funding. And that's particularly compounded again, as Carol already said, for groups that are historically minoritized or marginalized or haven't had access in the past. So how do we go out of our way to just make sure that groups know this funding is available? And the grant round that we ran in December, we did as a completely open grant round, which was obviously quite bold in terms of the volume of applications, but we felt this was a really important way to start to demystify the funding process and also make sure that we could provide as much support alongside that open funding round to help people who are interested in applying and understanding it. I think the second thing I wanted to talk about was I would hope that groups would feel that it wasn't a waste of their time going through this process. And I think building on that comment about an open funding round that in that context is even more important that we don't waste people's time because the likelihood of the availability of funding versus the number of applicants we get is quite significant. So we try to design a process that really, really minimized time wasting and sort of shared the cognitive load as much as possible. And the first thing we did was just have an eligibility questionnaire that was really simple and straightforward. And we had about seven and a half thousand people took that questionnaire. And if they answered yes to one of the questions, they were just politely told this one isn't for you. And on average, we think that took about, based on our data, about two minutes to complete. So really kind of simple and easy. People could look at the funding and then learn if it wasn't for them. We then had a sort of first stage application where we just asked four really simple questions and groups could either copy and paste from existing applications or just leave us a voice note or a video. 
And one thing we definitely found from that is that we got a lot of videos and voice notes from sort of local community groups at the end of a long day who were clearly absolutely exhausted and just didn't have the time to sit down and write something down, but they could just sort of pick up their phone, press that microphone button and share some perspectives. And that was really great. And we saw that about 25% of people who came through that process used that option. But again, our data told us that filling it out took about 10 to 15 minutes on average. So we really hoped we weren't wasting people's time or people having to spend a long time on that fund. We then did a kind of sift against our eligibility criteria that was on the website and identified from that initial pool of applicants, those applicants that, that were indeed in scope. And for every single in scope applicant, we then worked with them to co-produce a grant memo rather than asking them for a full application. So we sat down and had a one-to-one -one, produced a grant memo together. And again, really just tried to share that cognitive load, but also building on what Mary Rose has already said, by doing the grant memo, we hope that they would leave the process with something useful that they could take to other funders and almost use it as a coaching opportunity to sharpen their own strategy through that process. And I think the final thing I'll say about that is that we did that in a way that we had a participatory decision-making panel make the final decisions. So it meant that when we were co-producing the grant memos, the grantees or prospective grantees could be as honest as they wanted because it wasn't us making the final decisions and they knew that. And then the final two things, which I'll just rattle through really quickly, is we would hope that grantees coming through the Civic Power Fund would feel like their own impact has improved. So trying to provide that one-to-one -one coaching, that back-end support, that connection to other groups and peer learning, and just finding those opportunity for impact alongside funding, which we know is the most important bit of that. And then we would just hope that their experience, having said all of that, is as simple and easy as possible. So trying to have really short and clear grant agreements, minimizing any restrictions, making sure the funding is unrestricted and core wherever possible, and then really just like shouldering the burden of any due diligence and constantly putting that under review. I think, as I've already said, I think we do have a lot to learn. And certainly we've got feedback from that process that we could have had an even tighter eligibility and even clearer communication with prospective grantees. But some of the initial feedback we have done suggested that grantees did have a good and very good experience of coming through that, even if they didn't access funding. So I think for us, that learning point is, is, is really important as well, just learning from the experience and improving as we go along. Thanks, Martha. Um, Alex, your you're, Lloyds Bank Foundation is probably at the, in terms of longevity, at the opposite end from, from, from Martha, as you've been doing this for a very long time. So how, how would you say that the, the experience of applying to, to LBF differs from what Martha was just describing in engaging with the Civic Power Fund? I think the first thing I would say is you're never too old to learn. So there's no, <laughs> there's, you can't be too complacent because um, um, even if you've been in this kind of game a long time, um, people's expectations move on. And one thing actually that I was reflecting on in, in when Martha was talking about Kind of really interrogating the simplicity and accessibility of your processes there's two things that we've actually introduced in recent years that we think are very powerful for our um for for kind of setting the tone of our application process and those are um webinars where we talk about um um, um our like explain you know in person our, our funding processes um so that people can really clearly rule themselves in or out and the second is an opportunity to have a, a screening phone call with a member of the um, grants officer team so they can talk to someone face to face about whether or not their organization is right for our fund. And we see that lots of people that's really valuable for people to establish a kind of a connection and a relationship with us as a funder, uh, but also to kind of understand whether they actually um, want to kind of um, whether they they um, should invest their time, which is obviously extremely scarce um, in putting forward an expression of interest. Um, I also want to pick up something that, that Carol mentioned, which was about trusting relationships. And for us, that those are so critical in a positive kind of funder-grantee relationship, because they really underpin our ability to have a kind of a lasting impact on the organisation, both through our the kind of financial support you might offer them, but also the um, um, the kind of non the funder plus work that we might put in place. And we want to be really clear with organisations when we work with them, when they work with us that our expectation is that we want to build a kind of more resilient organization. We have a huge range of opportunities for them to engage in additional support beyond the grant during the lifetime of, um, during the lifetime of, our, of our support. But for that to work well, they need to be really clear about what, what capacity they need to engage and they need to not kind of overwhelm themselves with kind of consultancy, with um, learning events and be able to kind of um, uh, kind of prioritize and pace that support uh, in a way that works for them. And I think being able to kind of broker that support intelligently 
depends on a really high level of trust between us as a funder um, and them as a charity that goes well beyond the kind of um, the kind of power dynamics that you normally get between funders um, um, and funded organizations. And I think it's it's really difficult to achieve, but it's kind of something where you have to make, make sure that every touch point you have with the organization is really in line with your values. Um, um, as an organization and, you're, and that you're building those kind of that level of trust in those relationships. For us, that's partly to do, I think, with, with the commitment we make to organizations. So being able to say, here's unrestricted funding, we trust you to spend it as you like, and we're there for the long term. But it's also about our kind of daily interactions um, and having a kind of a regional manager who really knows that organization and, and can invest in them. Um, the final thing that I, I, I suppose I want to say is about um, evaluation. Um, and ensuring that like the way that we ask for updates on their on their work show that we care uh, but also respect the kind of proportionality of that process we don't want our reporting to be a burden on organizations we want it to serve a kind of mutual learning or, um, um, for both us and for them um, and making sure that those processes are proportional um, and that they um, that they build uh, continue to build that kind of that that degree of trust and relationship and, and the organizations are really clear on why we might ask for information, how we're going to use it. That's really critical, I think, to, to kind of building that quality of relationship. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, Mary Rose, long time no speak, sorry. Um, I, I know from hearing you talk previously that the driving force between you setting up the four was what you perceived as a disconnect between funders and small charities. So how have you seen this change in your time at the fore and how have you seen it develop? And, and where do you think you've got to as an organization now in, in, in solving that problem? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I've been at this for including, so we, I started piloting the four model in 2012. So it's now 11 years. And um, I think that things have changed in the funding sector and it's fantastic to hear about um, Carol and Martha and Alex's um, processes and how they interact with charities that are applying to them. And a lot, I won't go through how our process works because a lot of it is very similar to what Martha does. It's, we don't make the decisions. We have panels which include people who run small charities to make the decisions. It's all about trying to, reduce the burden on the applicants. We do take a lot of applicants, but we do that because we're looking for the people who aren't often most confident in getting funding. Unless we take lots, then we don't get those people. Um, but we have some really strong data that shows that we are um, getting funding into charities that 360 giving is great for this, um, that are failing to access trust and foundation funding um, in other before they work with us. Um, but I think that there is definitely a lot of progress in the sector. Um, I mean, I know Lloyds Bank, you changed your strategy about five, six years ago, because about four of your colleagues came and talked to us when you were doing strategy change about how to interact with charities, because I, well, I was, I was told that you'd heard some good feedback from small charities on what we do. So that was really lovely to hear. Um, but I think there is still a long, long way to go. And um, a lot of the big foundations um, from what we're hearing on the ground from small charities have gone backwards since COVID, which is really disappointing. They were much more open, much more um, interested in the idea of unrestricted funding, in the idea of and the realization that small charities on the ground just don't have the resource to fill in complicated forms, to um, uh, kind of twist themselves into knots into what funders want to hear. And um, everyone was really thrilled about that in the sector, I think, but it is really disappointing that we are hearing from a lot of the people that we work with that that experience is, is changing and has changed. And a lot of funders have sort of, uh, they're, you know, they're revisiting all of their processes and they're looking at strategy and in the process of that, they have made things a bit harder again. So I think in terms of, um, Ray, your question about how things have changed. There has been progress, I would say, and I think that um, funders are definitely thinking more about the experience of the small charity than they were before, but it's not enough and it's not fast enough. And I mean, if you look at the data in the sector, the NCVO Almanac 
shows the amount of funding going to small charities it is still on a downward trajectory and you know for us it's one of my big impact aims personally is to try and change that line so if you in the last 20 years the 20 years ago about 30 percent of sector funding which was about 36 billion went to small charities and it's now down to 20 percent which is less than 10 billion so it was about 12 billion 20 years ago and it's now down to like eight or nine billion and you know we are never we do what we do because i believe that the best solutions to social challenges come from the people who have are closest to those issue the issues that they're solving so we're never as a society going to solve our own problems unless we are making sure that money is getting into grassroots organizations who have got solutions and those solutions i mean we're particularly um uh focused on the ones that have got you know the potential to scale their impact but it's not just those it's the ones that just need to be there doing what they're doing and we all as funders need to work a lot harder to get money into those small charities on the ground and social enterprises. So yes, I sadly, Ray, I'm not going to be hugely positive. I'm going to say there's change, but there's not enough change. So Martha, did you want to come in there or you? I, I didn't know if that was a hand or if it was a pen. It was a, a sort of a, a hand movement, not a hand up, but I am also very happy to come in there, but I'll also continue to follow your lead, Ray. Um, I, I just wanted to ask just one follow-up question to, to Mary Rosen now, but please, any of the panelists do, do chip in and interrupt or disagree with me at any point. I, I think if, if I put myself in the shoes of, of a small charity and listening to, to all you guys in the panel, it all sounds fantastic and it sounds really innovative and forward-thinking and inclusive and participatory and it doesn't sound like the experience I have as a small charity when I'm applying for funding. That feels totally different. So what's happening amongst the funding community to, to adopt these and to learn from what you're doing? And do you have big trusts and foundations knocking on your door and saying what you do is great, let's, let's, let's learn from it? What needs to be done to make the, the, the industry, for want of a better word, change and catch up? I'm, I'm happy to come back in if anyone else wants to start. We we are i mean we're all about collaboration and we are all about bringing i mean it's like what we do is we bring together the resource so that the charities have one um point of contact which is through us and then they have access to many funders who they otherwise would never get in front of so we are about providing a really well part of what we do not just providing an amazing service we hope for the small charities but it's also providing a really really valuable service for funders who are wanting to get money and skills into the grassroots organizations but they they aren't necessarily set up to do it I actually have a meeting in three weeks time with uh, the lottery, um, Ray, with uh, Phil Chamberlain. We worked with the lottery when we started, when we set up, and we've got some absolutely fantastic results in terms of the progress of the charities that we funded together, because you know it's not just about money, the skills are, we have um, results that show that the skills support that we're offering, and you know, similar to what Alex and, is offering at Lloyd's, and Carol, you at Money For You as well, you know, that's 60% 60, 60 of the charities say it's as valuable the skills support and the training and the access to expertise as the money itself and you know someone like the lottery isn't set up to be able to do that so we are really keen on building partnerships more broadly we work with a lot of family trusts and foundations that don't have staff and that basically up until now they've been funding their local church hall or they've been funding charities that they happen to come across in a random setting but they don't want to be doing that they want to be finding really like highly effective high impact charities that are you know run in by people who don't have access to trust and foundation funding who don't know people but they don't know how to go and find them so we hopefully offer really great service for funders from that perspective in that we have this amazing portfolio of organizations that are changing lives we're really proud of our diversity stats and 24 percent of the run are run by people with disability 24 percent are run by people of color um, and for funders, you know, they generally, particularly new philanthropists, you know, they are aware that they don't know how to find people, but it, it's about helping them 
and making it easy for them because you know as a funder you can imagine they're terrified of opening up and saying we're giving away money and if you've got no staff how do you possibly cope with the inundation of applications I think I just made up that word how do you cope with being inundated with applications it's a good one if it's not a word it should be um, and uh, so I think and you know we are really trying to make a concerted effort now to do a lot more communication I mean before we just didn't do it because we didn't have the resource ourselves to do it but we are now seeing how incredibly important it is and it's making a real difference talking much more loudly about what we're doing so that hopefully these big funders will get to a point where they they can't ignore practice that is working better for the small charities on the ground we all that's what we're told by the small charities and you know i hope i hope it's true because we are that's what we're intending to do so yeah that's thank you that makes sense um I, I, alex there's a question in the um in the chat i just thought you might be able to help us but um mm. because i think you you work a lot with small charities but also some some medium and larger sized ones i think on occasion and there's something in the chat about how that funders can help build networks so that larger charities can offer support to smaller charities and facilitate that. Is that something you guys have thought about or have, have worked on at all? Um, I would say that, um, I mean, our sort of, we take a, a, um, a kind of a definition of small charities that we will fund anyone with a turnover up to half a million pounds. And I think, you know, in terms of the kind of the way the NCVO um, kind of defines that through their almanac, they would say that was a, um, a kind of in the medium sized charity territory. Um, and I think we've done a lot of thinking and reflection about where our kind of sweet spot is in terms of the organizations where our particular blend of kind of financial and non financial um, support can have the most impact. Um, I do think that there is a lot that um, um, there is a convening power um, that our funders have that can bring organizations together to learn from each other. Um, but we have to do that responsibly. And we also have to think that um, um, uh, the, the sort of learning that can take place between charities of different sizes is not just one way. Um, small charities are highly resourceful. They're experts in the work that they do on the ground. Um, and I would say that kind of large organizations has a, have as much to learn about kind of connection and rootedness within a community and a place or um, um, or expertise around the, your, your kind of mission as um, as the other way around. Um, but I do think that um, um, I've just been in a kind of call this morning, which is about how can organization, how can funding organizations uh, kind of best convene kind of learning communities and communities of practice. Um, and someone made the point in that conversation that if small charities took up every invitation that their funders uh, offered them to participate in, in um, in learning conversations and in networks, there wouldn't be any time to do the work. Um, so we have to think really responsibly about how we how we kind of make offers um, um, and um, and respect the time and resources that small organisations have. Great, thank you, um, Carol. I just want to come over to you just briefly. Um, I see there's been some discussion in the chat about capacity building, um, which I think you've responded to. If you could, you just give us your thoughts on the capacity building in the sector and where that really fits in for your support for small charities? I think it's really important to clarify what people mean when they say capacity building, because are you really building the capacity of people or are you giving them, you know, support that impacts on their capacity, which I think people are pushing back against. Um, when we talk about capacity building, we're thinking about, you know, the fact that we attach a consultant on the accelerator um, program to all the organizations, somebody who's with them from start to end, helping them. And usually they start, first of all, by taking a digital resilience check, a diagnostic, which tells them where their organization is. They get a bespoke action plan and the consultant works with them throughout to help them get to where they need to be. Um, so that's it's one thing to clarify that and then you know because if you're just offering services with people who dip in and out sometimes it's really hard i know you know being um the recipient of that kind of support whilst we've appreciated some of it some of it hasn't really been helpful but if i could go back to something that a couple of um 
the funders on the call have mentioned around <laughs> unrestricted funding. And, um, and I really love the fact that for Lloyd's Bank, you know, Lloyd's Bank, um, people are allowed to spend the grants the way they want. I want to take a step back from that. You know, for me, what um, true unrestriction would look like would be not asking me to tell you what I'm going to use it for to start with. I have never been able to apply for anything where you didn't have to specify what you needed it for. Um, the second thing also, or how it's going to make a transformation, you know, transformative impact, and then you decide whose transformation is more worthy than somebody else's. I suppose true trust, if you like the mission and you like where it's been so far and trust where it's going, you would allow them to really know what it can do and trust that that's as transformative, you know, a brick phone for certain people would be as transformative as it, uh, a smartphone. And I think I use that very simple example because it's real life, something I've been involved with in terms of decision making. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I really want um, funders to think when they're thinking about participatory methods of grant making to take a more radical approach that's co-creational. So right from the start, you get the sort of people who are going to be recipients to design the process with you. It's not just enough to make the decision. But also, yeah, making decisions great. And at the end, being transparent about how it's all gone through. But then also thinking about how people not just spend as they want once they've received it, but can actually apply for a particular amount. Yeah, for whatever they want to use it for. So, and I know that's probably <laughs> a little bit scary. You know, but yeah, how about that? How radical can we get when it comes to grant making? Because it's not enough to say, yeah, spend it how much you want, but then justify what you want to spend it on before we give it to you. That may take a while to catch on, but it's a very interesting thought. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Um, Martha, there's one other question that, um, in the chat about whether funders considered volunteering time as, a, as monetary value in a funding application. And I know that um, Civic Power Fund is, is, is about participation as well as just about, about charitable activities. How, just want, want to get your thoughts on how you view you know, the, the value of voluntary participation within an organization when you're working with community groups and small charities. I wouldn't say it's something that we would ascribe monetary value to. And, and maybe if I'm being really honest, I'm not quite sure I understand that kind of distinction. But I would say that one of the things that we look to in terms of understanding whether the resources or the organizations we work with are having the impact that they wanted to have is that capacity to kind of bring people together, bring people together who are like genuinely rooted in their local community, bring diverse voices together, and then sort of hold that power in place over time. So we've been working quite closely with community organizers to design not an impact evaluation framework because we feel like evaluation is not the right term for this work because it's so organic and fluid and rooted in what communities want and need, but a learning framework work to see how can we understand where money or resources or input have actually helped in terms of like building that local people power building up that participation holding it for the long term and then those people being able to influence power or influence politics in a way that works for them but I think I wanted to just sort of touch on one other question in the chat because I know that we're about to close which is a question of values and I think Mary Rose sort of hinted at this as well, that I think there's a lot of stuff that we can do in terms of, we do actually know now what processes make life easier for small charities. Like a lot of work has been done to demonstrate that. The question really comes to like, what's stopping funders adopting those processes? And I think often that actually is a values question about really being prepared to cede power and control back to communities and back to the grassroots and therefore being willing to think very differently about timeframes, about definitions of impact and even about kind of attribution and understanding that it should be groups and communities that are determining what success looks like, not 
boards and organizations that are often very far away from that work. So I think there's a, there's a kind of maybe follow up conversation to be had around like what is the values shift and although loads of progress has been made and there's some real kind of forward thinkers in the space, there's still a lot more collectively could we could do to shift those values and to really kind of create a sector and environment that trusts people first. I think that's a wonderful note to finish on. Um, I can see lots of people nodding. Thank you, Martha. And maybe as, as a panel, we can take that away as a bit of a call to action that we need to follow up on participatory processes. Mary Rose. Can, can I just say one thing really quickly? Because I think we've got a lot of small charities on here. And I hope that this has been useful. I'm not sure. It, I hope that you felt like it's been. But one thing I think you could all do to help us try and help change the funding system, because it sounds like the four of us here are trying to do things a bit better, we hope, but is please do talk really loudly about funders that you think are doing a really good job. Um, really do speak about it, because otherwise the big ones will never learn. So that is something that you could help with in hopefully quite a, a quick and easy way. Excellent point. Thank you. Um, and lastly, I'd like to just thank you all for dialing in and thank you for listening. Um, we hope this has been really useful. Um, and I'm sure I speak for the, the rest of the panelists to say that we hope beyond anything else that this is, will help you to better understand the funding environment and the directions it's going in and be able to make a better funding choices for your small charity. Um, so thank you for joining. Very good to meet you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you guys. I hope that went in accordance with your your hopes. I thought it was really interesting. Um, and Mary Rose, I will follow up. Uh, I've been having a similar conversation with Phil Chamberlain. Um, Have you? I'd love to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah, there's, the, the, there's some stuff around the new strategy around what can we offer more than money. Yeah. Which I think I'm going to be leading on for the, the, the committee. I'm just talking to the chair about it at the moment. So yeah, there's there's a lot, and the, the lottery can't do it. No, absolutely. It's not a dream doing it, but um, it should be facilitating funding, enabling. Yeah, what's happened? Um, so yeah, let's follow up on that. Um, it would be really good to have a chat before I meet. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump off and let you guys chat. Um, but <laughs> thanks so much. Yeah, Martha and Carol. Sorry, I was I was staying on because I wanted to say really nice to meet you. Hope to meet yeah, you. Yeah, likewise. I, I'd love to catch up with you both separately. Um, yeah. but I, we can do that. Okay. That'd be awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Take so, care. Bye. Thanks, guys. Uh, but um, but Ray, yeah, that would be. It will. I mean, we've got some really quite fantastic in some ways but also really concerning um data that shows that the when we compared what we what, what we did when we worked together with the lottery the charities that we supported together doubled their income and then you the lottery went you started doing basically what we do without any of the skill support on your own and we compared apples with apples and that it was giving the same amount of money to the same size of charities and the ones that the lottery were doing on their own were they were a quarter their, their income was falling by a quarter in the same funding period um, without the skills support so and and it, I mean, it wasn't just the skills support it was also the application procedure um was identifying so it would be I mean, it would be so fantastic to be able to do more of what we're doing because what our model is so scalable because it brings in the skill support is all voluntary and we are inundated with people who want to give skills. Oh. Absolutely inundated. Yeah, we, the, the, both the application process, the due diligence is done by um, volunteers. I mean, we pay them a stipend, but they are people like Vic 
who um, is doing it for love, not for... Um, That's what uh, does everything for it. <laughs> But it's also we've got people who are, you know, business people who've worked in private equity or who've we've got someone who used to be a partner at Deloitte's um, who are working as consultants to the applicants through the process. So they basically do a gentle strategic review of the applicant as they're coming through um, and then they write up the application so it, you, the charities aren't being judged on their ability to write a report they're being judged on have they got visionary leadership have they got really strong management and if they you know if they are lacking in certain areas but they've got loads of promise in others like for example you know if their board is not very strong but um they've got an amazing idea and 